Bethany Henry is a graduate student in the University of Arkansas's Department of History. She is a member of the Cherokee Nation and serves on the board of directors of the National Trail of Tears Association. In this program, Henry discusses the role of the five civilized tribes in the Civil War. So to begin, I wanted to start with this book that I found actually in Rogers at an antique store. And it was um, published in 1933. And it's called The Indians of Yesterday. And I like to start with this little story because at the time, um, this is what, I, I did some research on the book and you would have found this in, in a typical library for elementary and middle school students. So the beginning chapter introduction says, chapter one, the Indian's world. I wanted to quote a few lines from, from this book. It says, long ago, people found their way to the continent of America. No one is really sure how or why they came. The accepted belief is that they came from Asia, crossing the Bering Strait and moving southward. Some say there was land between the hemispheres called Atlantis. It was said to have sunk below the ocean long ago. Believers in Atlantis say the people fled westward when it was swallowed up by the sea. In other words, when the land was covered by water, they came into America, Native Americans. Perhaps the secret of their coming will always remain hidden in the mysteries of their past. The Indian does not say that he came from any other land but this one. He says that he always was here. In the next page, towards the end of this chapter, it says a very striking statement. It says, with the coming of the white man, the civilization of the Indian was doomed to vanish. And if you go through the rest of the book, it says doomed to vanish. It says this statement four times in one little children's book. So I bring that up because what I hope that we'll walk away with after learning about the history of the five civilized tribes, their removal, and their involvement in the Civil War is that they are far from a people doomed to vanish and certainly not the Indians of yesterday. All right, to begin with, we'll look at where the five civilized tribes came from. From the first contact with Europeans, the native groups of the Cherokee, Choctaw, Chickasaw, Creek, and Seminole came to acquire a large measure of white culture and civilization. This is the area where they lived historically. They were commonly called the five civilized tribes. These groups were a sedentary people originally occupying permanent homes in this strategic region um, that guarded the lower reaches of the Mississippi River. European countries dealt with Indian tribes to optimize transactions to purchase tribal lands. In other words, Europeans were nice to the Indians because they wanted something out of it. They wanted the land. From the beginning, the United States dealt with the five tribes as foreign entities. Government treaties were signed and served as official documents when buying Indian lands. And these foreign entities, of which they considered themselves, they were more like us than, than what we believed. So where does the term five civilized tribes come from? The term the five civilized tribes, it didn't emerge until the later part of the 19th century. Most scholars agree that the term was used first by what was called the Indian Union Agency. The Indian Agency was a consolidation of the five tribes. Basically what happened was, prior to this time, prior to the latter 19th century, each of the five tribes, the Cherokee, Chickasaw, Choctaw Creek, and Seminole, had their own agency. And then the federal government decided to consolidate these agencies and appoint one superintendent over all of the five civilized tribes. So this was in 1874. And most scholars believe this is when the term five civilized tribes really emerged. However, the term civilized, um, the, the Native Americans, the five tribes, they had elements of civilization long before removal, long before the Civil War, and certainly long before 1874 with the foundation of the Union Agency. So if we were alive in 1830, just before the Indian removal, what would we have seen among these five civilized tribes? What would they have looked like? What does it mean to be civilized and what would have those qualifications been? One form of civilization was through subsistence. It's how they live, how they eat. The term civilized indicated the adoption of horticulture. The difference between horticulture and agriculture is that horticulture is the, is the intensive, uh, intensive planting of, uh, of a cultivation of one plant. In other words, you are in one spot and you cultivate and use that same land over and over. Whereas agriculture is the extensive use of plant cultivation. So you use a chunk of land and then you move to the next chunk of land. So that way the land lasts longer. So in contrast to most belief and most understanding, Native Americans had been practicing agriculture long before Europeans came. Europeans introduced horticulture was that intensive, stay in the same spot type of plant cultivation. 
Actually, the Native Americans practiced what was called a safety net eco economy, which is a type of subsistence. Have you all heard of the three sisters? Corn, beans, and squash, um, CBS. So the Native Americans would plant these three crops together. And um, why it's called a safety net economy is that if they lost one crop, they had two other to depend on so that their people could still survive. This was in contrast to the Europeans who came, the, the English who came and, and brought agriculture because that was, that was plant cultivation of one type, so one, corn here, beans here. It was in separate, separate chunks of land, and um, it, it ended up not supporting the Native Americans like their safety net subsistence had. The term civilized also meant the adoption of European cultural patterns and institutions, including Christianity. And so they, they taught them what they considered to be good characteristics of a citizen, such as Christianity, such as that the subsistence, the horticulture, and also education, what, which was another form of civilization. Um, they needed to be able to read and write in English. For example, the Cherokee, they had a written, a written syllabary, a written language in 1821 by Sequoia, as we have probably heard his name. They also developed a national Supreme Court in 1822 and a constitution in 1827. They were one of the first tribes to develop these. Um, and this represented or reflected to the Anglos, to the whites, that some civilization. So we've got subsistence, Christianity, education, and another form was through politics. Um, politics was considered to be a civilized characteristic among the tribes. And these tribes eventually, with the Cherokee beginning uh, of the five tribes, they developed a centralized government and written constitutions. In other words, they had a form of government that mirrored the American government. Another form is for intermarriage. A lot of us don't think about the five tribes being intermarried with whites or even blacks, but it was not uncommon. In fact, there were, were, there were many leaders among the, the five tribes who intermarried and would marry blacks or whites. And we even know that John Ross, the chief of the Cherokee, he was not full blood. He was mixed, which means somewhere along his lineage there was white and, and native. So materially, the, the lives on the outside, the lives of the five civilized tribes did not differ much from their white neighbors. Yet beneath the surface remained strong roots of customs and traditions and ideas as a part of their cultural heritage that had developed through untold generations. In other words, they were a strong people. Despite these changes they made on the outside, the tenacity and the integrity of their culture and their traditions remained strong. And we'll see that throughout this program leading up to um, the Indian removal and their stay in Indian territory. They were a proud and independent spirit, a firm belief in the common ownership of the soil, a strong conviction that their own law and government were best suited to their needs, and an unfeigned devotion to the great creator. These were inherent. On the whole, the five civilized tribes were a peaceful people, possessing a high degree of intelligence of the North American landscape. And I'll also point out that it was that intelligence of the landscape, not just the geography, but how to survive, was why the Spanish, French, and European, and the English who first came were so set on, they were so intrigued by the Indians and wanted them on their side. It was because of their knowledge of the landscape. So in 1830, prior to remo removal, we would have seen an American Indian of the five civilized tribes very different from the average white man's perception of a foreign, savage red man. The reality is an image far from a people doomed to vanish. In stark contrast, it was common for Cherokee, Choctaw, Chickasaw Creek, and Seminole families to own slaves, to trade with whites, to produce agriculture, dress in modern fashions, read the Bible, speak English, and marry whites. Many tribes assimilated, assimilated under European education, but maintained traditional practices, languages, and customs. Yet, despite all of these, all of these factors, the Indian's intelligence, the culture, wealth, and enterprise, Americans oppressed the tribes until they were forced to remove west to the Mississippi. This happened around 1830 with the Indian Removal Act, which provided for the removal of the five civilized tribes that were located east of the Mississippi, moving them west to Indian Territory. The federal policy of removal devastated the Indians and paved the path for more friction within and between the tribal nations, leading up to their engagement in the Civil War. In other words, what was happening with removal in 1830 had a great deal to do with the Civil War, with the division among the tribes prior to the start of the Civil War. But as, quote, foreign nations, each of these tribes were dealt with individually. They were required to sign treaties that ceded nearly all of their land.
Each of their stories, the Cherokee, Choctaw, Chickasaw Creek, and Seminole, are unique. And these next few slides, I'll go over briefly each of those tribes and just a brief history of each of those tribes. We'll start with the Cherokee. Cherokee Nation, from its earliest history, they were composed of many bands that were politically separate from, from one another. In other words, you had the overarching umbrella of Cherokee and then many bands underneath that each had their own division. The Cherokee is the largest of the five tribes. In a census of, seven, of 1735, they were estimated to be 64 Cherokee villages with a population of about 16,000. By the early 19th century, the Cherokees had organized their formal government and adopted a written system, which I have the Constitution here and the Cherokee Phoenix, which was the newspaper written both in, in Cherokee and in English. And then, of course, John Ross, an early picture of John Ross, who was the chief of the Cherokee Nation during removal and through, through the Civil War as well. It was the Treaty of New Echota in 1835 that relocated the Cherokee along what we know as the Trail of Tears. And this was over 900 miles of land and water from their original homeland in Georgia, Alabama, North Carolina, to Indian Territory. Yet the Cherokee are still a people far from vanished. Now we'll look at the Choctaw. Uh, the Choctaw homeland was Alabama and Georgia in, in, in the southeast. And they were also divided into smaller districts like the Cherokee. Early in colonization, the Choctaw had established diplomatic and trade relations with the French colonists. Now, I'll make that point that the Cherokee were more friendly with the English, and the Choctaw were more friendly with the French. That's because the Choctaw lived closer to the Mississippi River, what they called the Great Highway of Commerce. And the Choctaw had more contact with the French along that river for trade, to trade furs and other commodities. Um, the Choctaw Nation had formed their own newspaper, which I have behind here. They had two newspapers, the Choctaw Herald and the Choctaw Intelligencer. And I wanted to quote one of the lines from the Choctaw Herald, which was just after removal. So they had just arrived in Indian Territory. And this was written by the publisher. His name was J.P. Kingsbury. He was the son of the Presbyterian minister Cyrus Kingsbury, who you may have heard of among the Choctaw. So the, his son, J.P. Kingsbury, wrote about the Choctaw Intelligencer, or the Choctaw Herald. He said, we wish to make this a permanent paper, useful to the citizens and residents of the Choctaw Nation, and a channel through which the people can communicate with each other on all matters of public interest. To this end, for the benefit of such as many not understanding English, we design to devote one page of each number to the Choctaw language. In other words, he's just saying, this is what the paper's about. We want people to feel free to talk, and we want, want it to have both English and Choctaw. Well, people apparently felt free to talk because not long after its introduction, the newspaper's introduction, there is a man who wrote in he, under the pen name of Tubi. And he had written in, and I wanted to quote what he said in this newspaper. He says, I shall in the first place tell you that we are Choctaws and that we are not savages. Those of you who have never heard of us or seen us may consider that we are real savages. Sure enough, but gentlemen, I assure you that we are not in the same condition we were when your forefathers first found us. Here we have schools, we have religion, and thank God it is a true Protestant religion. So it says something about the Choctaw and, and their, their, their transition with, with the white man. And I, I like his statement, it's, we, we are not savages. You might think we're savages, but we have come a, far, a long way since your forefathers first found us. So the Choctaw people had been removed to Oklahoma with the Treaty of Dancing Rabbit of 1833, and yet they are far from a people doomed to vanish. We'll move on to the Chickasaw. The Chickasaw were the last to remove to Indian Territory, but they also had gone through a number of treaties prior to removal. The government had worked diligently to acquire the Chickasaw land, which is much of the reason why they were the last to remove. But facing increased settlement pressure uh, by the 1830s, nearly a thousand Chickasaw began migrating voluntarily to Indian Territory. In other words, you have this group of a thousand Chickasaw Chickasaw who moved on their own terms. But with that passing of the Indian Removal Act of 1830, they pretty much said there's, there's no hope for us here. We want to move to Indian Territory. So uh, 5,700 Chickasaw and 8,000 slaves relocated to Arkansas and Oklahoma. And yet the Chickasaw are, are still a people far from doomed to ban vanish. This picture here is a Chickasaw boarding school. It's a, it was first a mission school and then later used as a boarding school from uh, the 18... Latter, latter part of the 1820s. And the Creeks. Um, the Creeks had lived in villages much like the Cherokee and the Choctaw. They had a king called Amico. I think I spelled it wrong. No, that's his name, Moko, but 
his chief name is Miko. And what happened was the Miko was the traditional leader among the Creek. But with the passing of the Indian Removal Act and later the Treaty of Cusetta, which was the treaty that actually removed the Creek, the Miko was merged into um, a title called chief. But chief was not actually traditional among the Creek. They removed to Oklahoma in 1832, and there were 14,000 relocated, um, and 4,000 of the, of the Creek had, had died along the trail. We've got one more tribe, the Seminole. The, the Seminole was the smallest group of the five tribes, estimating about 3,000, and they lived in Florida. And they had a little bit of a unique story compared to the other four tribes because they tried to use the Spanish as, uh, as protection against the English and, and French. What they would do, the Seminole oftentimes would cross the Florida border into the colonies and, and raid and uh, steal things. And they would return and the government would pursue, uh, the, the colonies would pursue, but hit that, that Florida border and meet resistance from not only the, the Seminoles, but also the Spanish government saying, you can't cross our land, this is, this is our land. Uh, although we have no record that the Spanish actually encouraged the Seminole to have these raids or to cross the border, we just know that they did not want the English crossing their land. It was the Treaty of Moultrie Creek of 1823 that called for the removal of the Seminoles from Florida, um, and there were actually 4,000 Seminoles that were removed, and 500 of them were black Seminoles. With all five of the tribes now in Indian Territory by 1840, they moved out of this tragic era of forced relocation into one of the bloodiest wars in American history. Prominent in much of the fighting in the Western theater were Native Americans. It is estimated that there were approximately 20,000 Native American soldiers during the Civil War, and even recent scholarship has, has increased that number. The Civil War not only divided the fabric of the United States, it also divided members of the five civilized tribes. The choice of American Indians to join the Union or the Confederacy was born from the frustrations at the displacement and suffering they'd experienced for decades prior to the Civil War. Military involvement was a way to potentially obtain a larger, more secure land base and maintain the Indians' way of life that was threatened by continued forced removal. So which side did the Indians, did the five tribes choose to fight for? Let's talk about Union re recruitment. The Indians distrusted the United States federal government due to unkept promises to protect them against hostile tribes like the Plains and the Comanches and prevent white settlement in the permanent Indian frontier. Basically, after removal with those treaties, each of those treaties with the government and the five tribes, the government had promised that they would protect them against the tribes that already lived in Oklahoma. So the five tribes were not relocating to Indian territory, and it was an empty space. There were tribes already living there, so there were either two options. You relocate, again, the tribes that lived in Oklahoma, and then replace them with the tribes in the east, or you place your bets and hope that the two different kinds of tribes are going to to live together in harmony. Well, that didn't quite happen. And so the Indians were, they didn't trust the government because they didn't uphold their promises in those treaties of protecting the tribes in Oklahoma and Indian Territory. Another hammer to the Indian allegiance um, to the North or, or the federal government was in the spring of 1861, when the federal government withdrew their troops from the forts in, in Indian Territory. So another part of that treaty, um, a part of the promise from the federal government to the five tribes was if you relocate and you go to Indian Territory, we'll protect you from these other tribes and we'll also set up soldiers in these forts that will protect you. So they withdrew these soldiers in 1861, which left them vulnerable to, to other tribes and also the Confederacy, as we'll find. This withdrawal relinquished treaty commitments and protection and left the tribes more vulnerable to the wooing of the Confederacy. Many tribal members took offense when the United States government also decided not to pay the tribal annuities in 1861. So that was a third part of the promises that the federal government had made in those treaties. We're, we're going to protect you from Indian tribes, we'll set up soldiers in the forts, and we'll give you annuities. We're going to pay you. Well, they ended up not doing that. So we can kind of see that Union recruitment was not doing so well at the onset. The Union was a little late in their game in seeing that the American Indians would be advantageous for the Civil War because they didn't see them as an advantage. And they also knew that the Indians weren't upset with them because they had withdrew their troops from, from the forts. It wasn't until 1862, nearly a year after the, the war had began, that regiments of Indian Home Guards were formed. The 1st, 2nd, 3rd, and 4th regiments were, of Indian Home Guards were established in 1862. And these regiments were developed from the five tribes. 
Two of those Indian home guards would later fight in the Battle of Prairie Grove, just in our backyard. I have this image. It's an unidentified Native American soldier. He's dressed in a Union uniform. He's wearing a plumed slouch hat up at the top, holding a revolver in his left hand and a sword in his right. He's ready for action. All right, Confederate re recruitment. So what we have um, set up here is that the Union was not doing well in recruiting the five tribes. They, were, they had had failed promises through their treaties, weren't protected them, and certainly weren't paying them the, the tribes their annuities. So then you have the Confederacy who certainly takes advantage of this. In fact, they began recruiting the five civilized tribes even before the Civil War began. So when these troops, the federal troops were abandoned in 1861 in Indian Territory, um, the Indians turned to the Confederate troops to protect them because they were there and they were willing to help the Indians. But before the regiments could be formed of the Confederacy, the Indian Territory had to officially become a part of the Confederacy. To accomplish this, Richmond, which was the capital of the Confederate States of America, they used the same treaty process which the United States had made with the tribes in acquiring the treaties with the American Indians with the five tribes in Oklahoma. Jefferson Davis, of the president of the Confederacy, he named Brigadier General Albert Pike the commissioner of Indian tribes west of Arkansas and south of Kansas. Pike, he was a wealthy newspaper man and a lawyer man. Um, he was from Massachusetts, but he moved to Pope County, Arkansas. Um, he had acquired quite a bit of, um, of respect among the five tribes because he had served as a lawyer uh, during the Seminole War, and he had won, won those cases for, for the Creek Nation. So he had won some respect among the tribes. He also spoke the languages, which, which helped. So he was selected and chosen by Jefferson Davis to work on behalf of the, the five civilized tribes. He rallied um, thousands of troops from the Indian Indian Territory, and even from Texas, and, and he was able to acquire the first and second Cherokee Mountain Rifles, the first Choctaw and Chickasaw Mountain Rifles, and the first Creek Mountain Rifles. Basically, within three months of his commission to Indian Territory, in the early parts of 1861, even before the Civil War had began, Pike had negotiated nine treaties, nine Confederate treaties, with the five civilized tribes. He offered them incentives and bribes to join the Confederacy, and we're going to look at that later. What are the reasons why they joined the Confederacy? But Pike was under no illusion about the quality of manpower he commanded. The, this Arkansas general, he described these Native American tribes as entirely undisciplined, mounted chiefly on ponies, and armed very indifferently with common rifles and shotguns. Now, this wasn't far from the truth. The shotguns, that the, the, the weapons that the Confederacy gave the Native Americans was far from what was commissioned to the other white soldiers and far from what they needed to actually, to actually fight, which is why many of them resorted to guerrilla warfare. So Albert, Albert Pike was successful at signing treaties with all five of the tribes. The Creek Nation was the first to, to sign the Treaty of Friendship and Alliance. Oh, so beautiful. It makes you want to join the war, the Treaty of Friendship and Alliance. And this was signed in July of 1861. This was the first treaty. So the Creek were the first nation to join, the Cherokee were the last, and we'll learn more about that in a few slides. So there were a number of promises made by the Confederate States to the five civilized tribes. Why would you join the South? Um, the treaty imposed obligations that the Confederacy was going to do. Some of these are listed. A few important ones are the protection of their boundaries. Um, so the Confederacy promised, like the United States had, like the federal government, that they would protect the tribes from outside invasion. They also promised them that the five tribes would not have to fight outside of Indian Territory. There were other, other agreements as well, like the permission to establish forts and military posts and roads. Also the expansion of railroads through Indian Territory. Um, and there was a guarantee of tribal lands. In other words, really, if you read the treaty with the Confederate States and the five tribes, each of them had their own separate treaty. It's... It looks delightful. Oh, I'd, I'd want to join. They, they promised them money. They promised them the, the annuities that the federal government had failed to promise them, protection. And even after the war, the, m one of the most important promises they made them was a seat in the Confederate Congress. So that was in Richmond, Virginia, the capital. And as a, as a nation that had just been removed from your homeland and come to Indian Territory and you're trying to establish your new way of life, and make that your new homeland and you're just beginning to create a strong foundation for your government, it would be very appealing to have a seat in the Confederate Congress in Richmond. Very appealing. So that's just one of, one of the many reasons why the Confederacy had 
chosen to cast their lots with, with the Confederacy, or why the Indians had chosen to cast their lots with the Confederacy. The Confederate treaties, most importantly, they were very clear to point out that, quote, as long as the grass shall grow and the water run, the Indian property would be his. Okay, that's quite a promise. Another leading factor that contributed to the five tribes' participation and joining of the Confederacy was slavery. Because slavery, slavery was declared legal in Indian territory by the Confederate treaties, and Indian nations were promised the enforcement of fugitive slave laws. So as I had mentioned before, the, the five tribes had participated in slavery long before Europeans, and they continued to practice that institution even in Indian territory. It was important to their, their way of life, the, the agriculture and they needed the labor. They especially needed the labor in Indian territory to rebuild their lives, their communities. So these, the five tribes that were still reeling from the harsh reality of their removal 30 years previous, tribal members were, they were still slaveholders and found more political and economic commonality with the Confederacy than they did the Union. Though slaveholding tribes identified with the Confederate mission, many tribes in the Trans-Mississippi West saw joining the Confederacy as their only way out of the circumstances they faced. So alliance with the South was a strategic political move for the five tribes because the Confederacy had promised them that seat in the Confederate Congress, also um, the, the trade networks and protecting them. Now remember, also a part of that provision was they promised the five tribes they would not have to fight outside of Indian territory. They would not call upon them to leave Oklahoma and fight. So l like I mentioned before, there's over 20,000 American Indians that fought in the Civil War. And they fought mainly as scouts, spies, guides, interpreters, and foot soldiers for, for both sides. The Confederacy were initially able to gain more of the five tribes on their side because of these in incentives that they provided through the treaties, but also their strategy. They were very aggressive in obtaining the five tribes. And the Union was, was a little standoffish at the beginning. Um, and they also did not see the American Indians, the five tribes, as advantageous for the Civil War. It wasn't until the end of 1862, around 1862, that the Union began recruiting the American Indians. All right. Although the five tribes fought for both sides of the war, their engagement is a tricky story. Their incentives to, to join either side were varied from common ground in slavery to economic, ec economics and trade relations to political reasons. But their loyalty to each side was even more varied. As the war progressed, more and more of the five tribes defected to the Union. In other words, they switched sides. So at the beginning, the Confederacy was able to grab their hold on the five tribes. Later in 1862, you have some Union recruitment. And in 1863, the Cherokee were one of the first of the five tribes to sign a treaty with the federal government. In other words, they held this convention with Chief John Ross, who had returned from Washington, D.C., and he had been up there trying to withhold and support the integrity of the nation, that the Cherokee had always been patriots and always supported the Union. In 1863, he convinced the, the Cherokee, the majority of the Cherokee, to agree in this new treaty with the Union that said their that said that the Cherokee Treaty with the Confederacy was null and void and that this new treaty with the Union was to be upheld. And they man maintained that position for the remainder of the war. This was in 1863. Many of the other tribes followed suit. But what we'll find later is that regardless if the tribes had signed a treaty initially with the Confederacy or the Union, it didn't matter. They were treated the same during Reconstruction. Now we're going to look um, at a few reasons why they would have defected, which means switched. Why? Well, for one reason, um, the promises that the Confederacy had made to the Union, or to the five tribes, through weapons and through clothing and through annuities, through payments, those were never made. Other reasons were the, the five tribes were called upon to fight outside of Indian Territory. Pea Ridge being an example, Prairie Grove being an example, Newtonia Battlefield just north of us in Missouri, another example. There were several engagements outside of Indian Territory where the five tribes fought. Even Albert Pike, the, the commissioner of the Indian Affairs, even he said, this is wrong. We shouldn't be calling upon the five tribes to fight. And as we'll later see in, an, in another slide, there were many, many engagements in Indian territory. This also reflects failed promises by the Confederacy because in those articles, in that first treaty of friendship and alliance, it said, we will protect you from, from outside forces coming in to, um, to take, take over in Indian territory. So just the fact that there were engagements within Indian territory is an indication that they did not withhold their promises. Now we're going to look at two engagements 
that were at the early part of the war, Pea Ridge and the Battle of Newtonia. These were two remarkable Civil War battles that played important roles in this War of the West. The Battle of Pea Ridge was fought March 6th, 7th, and 8th of 1862, and it was a Union victory. This Union victory was significant because it preserved that Missouri-Arkansas line, and it ensured that Missouri would remain in the Union. It was significant, and it, it really did turn the tide of the Civil War. Pike had protested to the Confederacy in bringing the, the, his regiments, the 1st and 2nd Cherokee Mounted Rifles, to, to Pea Ridge. He had protested this. Nonetheless, these objections were ignored, which violated those treaties, and Indian regiments were armed to join the Army of the West at the Battle of Pea Ridge. Many Indian tribes refused to leave Indian territory, but two of those full regiments, the 1st and Cherokee Mounted Rifles, had agreed, all right, we'll, we'll go and fight at Pea Ridge. On March 7th and 8th, 1862, Albert Pike had brought his 1,000 Indians uh, mounted and dismounted attacks against the federal forces at Pea Ridge. Despite Pike's Indian regiments, um, there were many claims in the newspapers that Pike's Indians were, were chickens, basically, that they had fleed and they didn't obey Pike, Albert Pike. They didn't listen to him. There were reports that maligned the Indians for not standing up against the artillery, for running away. Serious charges were made against the Native Americans at Pea Ridge in reports claiming that several dead Union soldiers were found on the field, tommyhawked, scalped, and shamefully mangled. The Confederate Army, of course, made protests against these claims. So in the Battle of Pea Ridge was significant not only for what it did militarily and politically, but also in the perception of American Indians that fought at Pea Ridge. There were only two journalists who were actually there at the Battle of Pea Ridge, although there were many, several, many, many reports claiming that they were there at Pea Ridge. In other words, we only have two real sources of journalists that were there at the site. The other reporters took their claims and wrote based on these two journalists. Those two names were William Fail of the St. Louis Daily Missouri Democrat and Thomas Knox with the New York Herald. Thomas Knox wrote in his, um, it's this first one, The Great Battle of Pea Ridge, he wrote in his newspaper of, of 1862 that Pike, Albert Pike was unfortunate with his Indians. While he was arranging them in line, the Indians made so much noise as to reveal their exact position. In a charge which our cavalry made upon a rebel brigade, we were repulsed, leaving several killed and wounded upon the ground. Some of Pike's Indians came upon these and scalped the dead and living without distinction. A rebel officer subsequently informed me that the same Indians scalped several of their own slain and barbari barbarously murdered some who had not even been slightly injured. So here we have this claim from a reporter that was there, Thomas Knox, during, and he had claimed that the five tribes, the 1st and 2nd Cherokee Mountain Rifles, had not only scalped but mangled men that were not even dead. This is his claim. Great contemporary controversy surrounds the legacy of Pea Ridge because of these claims. Albert Pike was, he did not believe these claims, and he went back to Indian Territory and tried to defend his Indians, tried to defend them. And the Cherokee, of course, even today, still rebuke these, these atrocities. We have other reports as well from Captain Eugene Payne of the 37th Illinois, who was a participant in the Battle of Pea Ridge. So he wrote about the Indians. He said, these Indians are bloodthirsty and savages. We know when we fight them that we have to fight them on a different principle than we do white men. We must be constantly on our guard as if we were fighting wildcats. Oof. And another report, uh, Captain Oliver of the 3rd Iowa Cavalry wrote about the Indians at Pea Ridge. Pea Ridge. He said, there was two of them infernal Indians taken prisoner, and we have seen one that was killed. I wish it, it had been the last of that race. There was quite a number of our men scalped by them, two of our own company. There will be no quarter shown them after this. That is certain. Even General Curtis, who was at the Battle of Pea Ridge, his son made a comment about the Indians, which is also striking. He says, the employment of Indians involves a probability of savage ferocity. Bloody conflicts seem to inspire their ancient barbarities, nor can we expect civilized warfare from the savage tribes. If any presumption has been raised in their favor on the score of civilization, it has certainly been demolished by use of the tomahawk, war club, and scalping knife at Pea Ridge. So after the Battle of Pea Ridge, Pike and the remaining Indians had returned to Indian territory, but not without bitter dispute. Indian units from several tribes along, along with an entire regiment of Cherokee had defected. In other words, after the Battle of Pea Ridge, many of the Cherokee had defected or they had switched sides, like I had mentioned. They, they went over to the Union, the Union side, because that was, that, the Battle of Pea Ridge was a Union victory.
Now we'll look at a second battle, the Battle of Natonia, which was fought in southwest Missouri. It was a rare battle because Native Americans, the five tribes, fought against each other on both sides of the conflict, whereas in Pea Ridge, the five tribes were participants on the Confederate side. This was also a significant battle because it was far from Indian Territory. It was, it was away from Indian Territory, um, which again violated those treaties. The first Battle of Natonia was fought on September 30th, 1862, which resulted in a Confederate victory. But that second Battle of Natonia, October 28th, 1864, resulted in a Union victory. Um, one of the historians that wrote about Natonia, her name is Annie Abel, she wrote in the early 20th century about Natonia. She sums it up and says, the participation of Indians in the Battle of Natonia was significant. Federals and Confederates had alike resorted to it for purposes other than the red man's own. The Indian expedition had now, for a surety, definitely abandoned the intention for which it was originally organized and outfitted. In other words, for whatever reasons the Indians fought at Pea Ridge, these reasons for fighting at the Battle of Natonia were even more complex, even more complex than fighting at the, at the Battle of Pea Ridge. Many of the Indians who fought at Natonia were from the same tribe, but divided their support. In other words, you have Cherokee against Cherokee, Choctaw against Choctaw in, in that Battle of Natonia. This is an extraordinary diary, a Civil War diary, that was written in by both a Union and a Confederate soldier. Uh, this is housed at the, at the Wilson's Creek National Battlefield. It was originally belonged to George Falconer, who was born in Fort Smith, Arkansas. And in 1860, he lived in Sebastian County with his stepfather and mother, and then he enlisted in the Confederate Cavalry. And in his notes, in this diary, he makes several accounts of of his travels with General Stan Wadey with the Cherokee Indians um, and the Confederacy into Indian Territory. But it was during the Battle of Locust Grove, which is in Oklahoma in Indian Territory, that Falconer was taken prisoner. This is when the tables turned because Albert Eli Thorpe, he was, he was a Native American within the Indian Home Guards. He was a, we don't know what tribe, but he was of one of the five civilized tribes. He had captured the diary of George Falconer and he began writing in the remaining of the diary. In fact, Albert says, the tables have now turned. We will open the journal on the other side of the question. This book was captured at the Battle of Locust Grove. That's what the, the first page says. This diary is it's extraordinary and unique because it has both sides of the Union and Confederate perspective. And uh, it, also has, it also has knowledge about the five tribes' engagement. For example, Eli Thorpe, who was the Native American in the Indian Home Guards, he makes a comment that his men fought bravely and nobly and no one was injured. That's one of his comments about, about one of their engagements. All right, this is a list of all of the engagements that the five civilized tribes were involved in in the Civil War. The red are those that are fought outside of Indian Territory, and the white are those fought within Indian Territory. The reason I bring this up is to give you a visual of the failed promises, again, by the Confederacy, because they had signed the treaty that said you didn't have to fight, they didn't have to fight outside of Indian Territory, and that they would be protected from invasion. So when we look at the number of red battles, we can see those are the ones outside of Indian Territory. Clearly, they were fighting against the treaty. Then the battles that are in white are those that were fought within Indian Territory. Clearly, another um, against the treaty as well, because they were not protected by from invasion. Native Americans did not cause or even want the Civil War, but they were inevitably drawn into the war as a result. The American Indians, as a result of their influence, and their engagement were they suffered more than any other group from the effects of the Civil War. Just as there are many reasons for war, there are various reasons for the five tribes' engagement in the Civil War and multiple impacts for their involvement. One of those impacts is, is politically. The Civil War impacted American Indian relations politically as a sovereign nation in the United States. The federal government had established laws that acknowledged Indian tribes as sovereign nations with distinct governments. On paper, it was the aim of the U.S. government to work with tribal governments for best practices and policy in war. But the chaos of the Civil War was a reflection that in failure in applying this vision. Another impact of the five civilized tribes' engagement is militarily. The significance of fighting beyond their home territory. In other words, fighting outside of Indian territory was significant in itself because it gives us an idea that they... They did have some connection with either the Confederacy or the Union. They wanted to support a cause greater than their own. They could have very well ignored both sides, or at least attempted to, and stayed within Indian territory and done their own thing. 
However, they were drawn into this larger conflict. And even as that historian that I quoted, she says, the American Indians at Newtonia, this, this engagement was significant because it gives us reason to know that they were fighting outside of Red Man's, Red Man's um, vision, outside of Red Man's goals. In other words, they were fighting for a, a greater cause, something, something larger than their own. This is also a reflection, uh, the Battle of Pea Ridge and Newtonia, their participation there also tells, it that, tells us that they were fighting for a national cause, bringing their actions into a historically verifiable significance on a national stage. Participation by Native Americans fighting outside of Indian territory is significant because the mere fact that portions of nations fought against each other, like at Natonia, Cherokee against Cherokee, Choctaw against Choctaw, this shows us that they were willing to defend not only their own lands, but also lend a hand in support of the wider Union or Confederate War. The third, reason, the third influence of the American Indians in the Civil War was socially. The Civil War had unraveled the fabric of society. Perhaps one of the biggest impacts from American Indians in the, in the participation of the Civil War was their relation within tribes, between tribes, and with the government to government relations. Accusations of the atrocities at Pea Ridge and Antonia inflamed these stereotypes and white perception towards Indians. The participation of, of the five tribes at Pea Ridge would not only affect their alliances between each other, in other words, Cherokee and Choctaw, Creek and Seminole, but it influenced how white man viewed them, especially because of these atrocities of, of scalping and Tommy Hawks and all those newspaper articles. After the Civil War, the five tribes were dealt with cruelly by the federal government. Like I mentioned, it did not matter if they had joined the Union or the Confederacy first or whether they were on the Confederate side towards the end of the war. They were treated the same during Reconstruction with those treaties. Regardless, if they were loyal to either side, land was stripped, railroads were imposed in Indian territory, and they were not given any of the payments that they were promised by the Confederate or the, or the Union treaties. But all in all, the five tribes, the American Indians, had lost more men in proportion to those enlisted than any other southern, southern state. They had suffered a great deal. Looking back, we can see that the five civilized tribes were not the Indians of yesterday. They had persevered. Their tenacity, their integrity, they had come all the way from the onset of the European arrival through the removal to Indian territory. And in spite of all these tremendous difficulties, they still had progress year after year, and their achievements in the field of culture and government have no parallel in the history of American Indians. They participated in one of the most important, constructive, and destructive eras in our nation's history. And as we celebrate the sesquicentennial of the Civil War, we remember the five tribes and their influence and their impact. The five tribes are a proud people. We are a proud people, proud of our heritage and our ancestors, and we hold a great appreci appreciation for our history and legacy and a keen sense of honor and faith in our creator. Thank you.